Good evening and welcome to Wednesday Night Live. I am Lauren and we are so grateful at Shekinah Kingdom Church to have you here with us tonight. If you are a first time guest, click the link at the bottom of your screen and remember to stay connected with us on all of your social media platforms. Also, don't forget to share tonight's video with your family and friends. They would love to see this too. We are so excited to have you and I hope that you enjoy the service. Well, good evening and welcome to Wednesday Night Live. I am excited to come into your home and to share with you in another segment of what we call here our Courageous Conversation Series. Do me a favor, share the video right where you are. You, I really want you to uh, invite your sphere of influence and those in your social circle to be a part of this moment. So tag friends you know, share the video uh, or the post or wherever you find yourself being in connection with us tonight. We're really excited about what we're going to share with you. To all of our guests who are viewing us for the first time, there is a link that you can press at the bottom of the screen to simply let us know that this is your first time and our staff will get in touch with you in the days to come. And We want to thank you for being a part of this. Also, you can make a spiritual decision even on a night like tonight. And if you accept Christ as your savior, rededicate your life to the Lord or become a part of our e-church family, there's also a link that you can press uh, at the bottom of your comment section as well and fill out that information and we want to walk you into your next steps in the kingdom of God. Finally, I want to thank each and every one of you who continue to, to contribute to our church on a regular basis. We want you to know how much we value your gifts. It doesn't matter the size. It is the heart you have toward giving that enables our church not only uh, to remain open and bring you the gospel, but to be able to do the kinds of things that you've seen us doing, particularly here lately um, around the news and in other places, social media, as we are helping organizations in our community, helping bless families and things of that nature. Your giving makes that work. So thank you. Well, tonight I'm very honored to be here. Uh, as I stated, we have been in a series on Wednesday nights called Courageous Conversations, where we're looking at certain aspects of life, particularly in the time and season in which we live, and we are having dialogues, worthy dialogue, um, with peers and those who are providing great insight. Tonight, uh, I am very pleased and happy to have four incredible minds with us who are going to be sharing uh, in the persons of Dr. Angelina Jones, um, Elder Al Punter, uh, prophet of the Eastern Jurisdiction, uh, chief uh, prelate and head intercessor of the Gatekeepers Association of America, <laughs> Sister Tan Wimbush, and my dear friend and brother and the executive minister of uh, the uh, First Baptist Church East End. I did get that right then. I praise the Lord. Uh, <laughs> my friend and brother, seminary partner, Reverend uh, Jamar Jones. Well, good evening to each of you. Thank you all for being uh, on this platform with me. I want to start uh, by just having each of you to share with us. Um, you can greet the people and then share with us a scripture that is a favorite of yours and uh, why it, if, if there is a reason why, uh, it bears significance to you. We'll just kind of get the ball rolling tonight. I should have sat over there. <laughs> uh, my favorite scripture is Psalm 46 and 10, which says, be still and know that I am God. It is the first sermon that I preached at Virginia Union School of Theology. And it also speaks to me because the, the chapter um, um, starts out with um, talking about how things get tumultuous and things are crazy. And there are always times and there are always seasons where life is crazy. And in that, no matter what God says, to be still, you know, to know that I'm here, that I am God, and he will take care of it. So no matter what season of life I've been in, that scripture always grounds me. Wow, incredible. All right, sir. All right, my favorite scripture will be Romans 8 and 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. That scripture is like, I think that scripture has been my life because there's been seasons and times I've gone through so much. And at the end of the day, God always brings it together and I always come out of what I'm currently in. So that's like my scripture that I hang on to. I'll probably hang on to that scripture to the day I leave this earth. <laughs> Amen. Um, my favorite scripture would have to be Proverbs chapter three, verse five through six. 
Um, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. And I think that just speaks for itself, especially with us being intellectuals. We often like to lean to our own understanding, but our thoughts are never going to be above God's thoughts, and we need to trust him and trust his ways and trust that he's going to lead us and guide us into all truth. Uh, mine would be Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and very courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord God is with you wherever you go. Um, every step I've taken in life, I've seen how the Lord has, like, cleared the path. And even in a lot of those times, I was afraid or felt like, you know, I wasn't enough to take the step. But the Lord made the way. So that scripture kind of resonates with me. Wow. Incredible. 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 I want to challenge those of you who are watching at home. If you do not know, if perhaps you're not sure, um, I think you probably likely at least are, uh, what, your, what your favorite scripture is or why it's important to you, I want you to share that testimony. Sometime between now uh, and the end of the week, particularly if you're on social media, you ought to just put up a post and share with people uh, what your favorite scripture is and why that is significant to you or why it matters to you. I think that's amazing. So our topic here tonight, um, as you all know, we're dealing uh, with spirituality as a whole and kind of what I call the fight for faith. Um, but I, I've chosen this theme, Lord, help me be spiritual. Um, I actually take it right out of a song by Donald Lawrence that he wrote some years ago. And um, the lyrics of the song start by saying, you're not a natural being. Um, having a spiritual experience, but you're a spiritual being who's living out a natural experience. And then he goes on to say, every day when you wake, your confession should constantly say, oh Lord, help me be spiritual. The reason why I chose this theme is because, at least for me, uh, one of the challenges I think in the times we live in is reminding myself um, of what it means to be a spirit being and how my spirituality affects every other area of my life. And also to ask myself how those other areas affect my spirituality. Whether we're talking about pandemic or whether we're talking about the litany of issues that are happening right now in our country and around our world. Um, I'm looking for what is the, what's the, the space so in, in what way does my faith play out in this? And I wanna lean into that um, a, a little bit here tonight. But in light of this idea about, you know, being spiritual beings and, and helping to, Lord, helping me to be spiritual, how would you, how would you define um, healthy Christian spirituality? In your own words, when you hear, help me be spiritual, what's, what is a healthy Christian spirituality like to you? What's some aspect of that? Or what do you think about that? Um, I think I would say that healthy Christian spirituality is rooted in the Bible. Is biblical it's rooted in a personal intimate relationship with Jesus Christ it has to be personal it has to be intimate you have to know who you are know who God is know how he communicates with you how you suck with him and I think it needs to be covered in love because sometimes we have people who are spiritual in the fact that they know the Word of God but there's no love and love is is the essence of who God is and what Christ is I would say a healthy, um, a healthy Christian relationship with God, um, kind of to piggyback off being personal and intimate, I would say it's someone who has constant communication with God. So um, not even in the sense of, well, I mean, you could frame it in the sense of prayer, but I just mean somebody who's constantly communicating with God, even if that is um, something you're doing at home, something you're doing at work, something you're doing when you're around others or even if just the way you live your life or the way you walk your walk and talk your talk represents who God is or the very essence of God, I would say it's that communication piece that you're always in communion, so to speak, with God. I would say um, a healthy spiritual life is that um, constant feeding yourself with the things of God. I, I equate it to if you want to live a, health, a healthy lifestyle, you exercise, you eat the right foods. So to me, spirituality is the same way where you have to constantly eat the things of God. That means, you know, getting in your word, getting in your phrase in, in prayer. Uh, worship, I mean, just that communication as Reverend Jamal was just talking about, that being consistent 
to be to be healthy spiritually. So you don't um so you don't have any um any like anything that's like wrong or anything that's like unhealthy, you have to like stay constant and keep feeding yourself every single day mm -hmm. on a daily basis. I think I'm just gonna echo what everyone has said, but um, I agree that to be um, spiritually healthy, you need to have soundness of mind and that comes into play with that constant communication, that prayer life, that worship, um, strength and personal conviction because your pastor doesn't always know. Right. Right. <laughs> um, and so I, I, you know, because the pastor is supposed to get his revelation from the Holy Spirit, well, you can talk to, you have direct commune. So it's like you have to have that personal conviction and love of self, love of God, and love of others. I think those all make you healthy. So I want to jump into something and pick it back off of something I just heard you say about needing to have enough spiritual sustenance within you and possess enough spiritual depth um, that you can sustain on your own because your pastor may not have everything. Well, let's put that in a context, and I want to just jump straight into this. For many churches, the buildings are closed. Some are worshiping in parking lots or outside, or uh, many are streaming live and things like that. But for the most part, most churches, um, particularly in, here in America or in our area, are shut down from the regular schedule program and my hunch is there are a lot of people who are itching to get back to the church you know we want to you know we want to and I mean nobody loves church probably more than me in terms of the reality of loving to be around the saints loving corporate worship the idea to be able to hear the word to have you know have a sense of uh, uh, interaction and fellowship however um, I don't even know how I want to phrase this question I, <laughs> my you know I admit that there's a bit of pressure on pastors Definitely. about opening the doors, and I'm not going to get into health issues, right? But this spiritual pressure, and even sometimes compassion really plays a low because there's some people who are struggling without the gathering. I, I just want to, to hear, and, and I don't even know if I'm going to phrase this as a question because I don't want to limit what your thought is, right? What do you think about this season we're in? I guess this is a question, but yeah, a very broad one. What do you think about this season we're in in terms of the pandemic and how the practice, the corporate practice of faith or church is affected? And I know that's a wide net. So however you want to lean into that. I mean, is it, you know, are you glad to some extent we're, we're not in the building? Are you, is it, are, are you sad? What do you have a, um, some sense of commentary or I mean, are there, are, you know, I don't, again, I don't want to shape this for you. I intentionally want to leave this open because I'm hoping I'll get some different perspectives on this. So for a while, I will be transparent and say I was immune to all of it. I was just going in and doing what we had to do because we had to do it. Um, so it's only been more recently, uh, we've shown older services in the last few weeks. So it's been more recently that I've seen, wow, the people really aren't in the building. We're not able to really fellowship. And I know from a preacher's perspective, the way we preach is like call and response in our tradition. So it's like, okay, well, you know, we say a little stuff when we preach, like type this in the comments, touch a nail. The reality is a lot of people probably laying in the bed with their phone watching Correct. service. You know what I mean? We think they're in there shouting and running around. They're Including not. my wife. <laughs> so I, I, I've been immune to it, but I think, I think that some good is in it. And the reason I say that is because we've been forced to either admit that a lot of what we, we were doing was unnecessary and not uh -oh. really God-focused, uh -oh. and also we've been forced to like confront our own relationship with God, spirituality. So was my relationship with God based on the church building or was my relationship with God based on who God is in my life as an individual? Uh, I'll share this and then I'll let somebody else talk. I had one of the members of our church tell me that the first time we did communion virtually, he was like, man, that's the first time my family has had communion together wow. since my children were small. Wow. And that was, that was in March. That was early in the pandemic. So I do think some good has come out of it, but I think we've had to confront perhaps what we may have not wanted to confront when we were going through whatever church was for us. 
I just want to jump in. You said um, something about our relationship with God. I think in addition to that, it was the relationship or the connection with the church. Mm -hmm. Why were you going to church? Mm -hmm. Was it because my girlfriends are there, because I can see people on Sunday, because I can show my outfit? But this has forced us to say, yes, that was where my reasons, or no, I went to church because that's really where I got spiritually fed. Right. And so if I'm just as transparent, I love it. Um, because as workers, I'm not, a, I'm not a pastor, I am a minister, but as a parishioner and as a leader in ministry, we can get so engrossed mm -hmm. in, act, in activity that we are stifled when inactivity is our lot. So I enjoy inactive, being inactive because I can get up, I can watch service when I want to. I can leave the pin curls in my hair and I can have worship when I'm ready for it. I love that. I love not being busy. Um, however, I do miss the fellowship. But outside of that, listen, Good. church has been, um, just to go off of something else you said, um, Pastor Jabbar, that we have learned that all this stuff was not necessary. Pastors have been intentional about making, service, making certain that services have been within an hour to an hour and a half. Their sermons have been more succinct, more content driven. They've been sans jargon and antics because it is call and response. You don't have yeah. anybody you're talking to. It's amen right. lights. Right. Okay, you can only say that so many times. And listen, <laughs> I have enjoyed the Ooh. fact that it has really filtered and sifted the unimportant, irrelevant extras right. and really got into the meat of what we're supposed to be doing. You got two songs, a preacher, and it's time to go. 20 minutes of announcements are unnecessary. Right. Right. 12 songs and two right. dances, unnecessary. Right. And I'm not saying these things don't help to um, reach someone, but they're just not always necessary every Sunday. So I love the truncated version of church. Right. And that's what, I was, that's what I was going to say. I, 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 don't, I don't want anybody to get the impression that we are trying to, like, remove some of the sacred traditions or customs that each individual church has, because all of us don't do church differently. Um, and I'm in a Baptist tradition, so y'all already know. Like, you know, y'all know how we get down. But a lot of it, if it's not, how can I say this? If, if ain't no God in it, right. if it's just what we want to do, I think the pandemic has forced us to say, okay, no, I, we don't have to sit as a body when it's our anniversary and wear a certain color. Right. Like we can celebrate our anniversary. We can celebrate our anniversary, however we want to celebrate it, or, or, or whatever the case may be. So I definitely agree uh, with you, Dr. Angie, about... And then when you're... If you're just coming to church and you're sitting on the pew and you're enjoying it, now that's one perspective, but when you are involved and I gotta play, I gotta preach, I gotta sing, I gotta welcome, I gotta greet, I gotta, it's a different flow and you're probably actually getting rest that you weren't getting before. And I can enjoy service because when, mm -hmm. you're, when you're working, uh. You miss, you're in, you get five minutes of that and then you get off and they're like, girl, right. she, he preached. I missed it. I missed it because I was serving <laughs> so, and I miss serving. So, you know, part of what I'm, I'm just hearing is, and I'm thinking about this in light of our topic tonight. What if church has hindered some people from really being spiritual? My goodness. I'm going to let y'all take that. So we become churchy. Right. Right. But not spiritually minded. I feel like we've become, we've, we've been a movie theater. We've been entertainers. Wow. And the pastor's a lead gesture. I mean, I just feel like for, for the most part, it's been entertainment. Now, you better get it and go. Because your people are going to log in. If you're not talking about and anything, they they're log logging off. off. And they're going to find their next pastor, their step pastor. Right. <laughs> <laughs> step pastors, foster pastors, adopted pastors, Lord have mercy. Somebody want to add in? I, I wanted to add in as a, uh, I guess, a parishioner. Um, for me, I've missed the fellowship. But what it's done and, and what I'm hoping it's done for a lot of us is um, made our devotion more sincere. 
and made us really have to get on our face and seek God for ourselves because a lot of people depend on, just like Pastor was talking about, that pressure they, or the praise team or the worship team. They depend on that to be pumped up or to be um, bought into the presence of God. But you have to know how to do that for yourself. You can't depend on a Sunday morning service to do that. You can't depend on, of course, the pastor is our shepherd and he's going to feed us. But I, my prayer <laughs> is that post-pandemic, and I might be jumping ahead, when people come back and hear they go for God like never before. And pastor might not have to get up and say anything. Somebody might not have to get up and, and sing a song. You know, you come in the building, but you realize I'm going for God like never before. You know, I just, I hope that it has changed our devotion and the way we see worship and the way we see how, what we need from God outside of the building. So when we get back in the building, it's different, you know? Can I challenge you on that? Yes. Do you think, and I'm just, I'm throwing this to everybody really, mm -hmm. including Pastor Cedric. Do you think that when we come back, whenever that may be, 2022 in my prediction, when we come back, do you think it will be a major like uh, 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 flock, almost like the old school tent revivals where people just came from everywhere? Do you think it's gonna be a major run in of people coming in and praising and worshiping and going for God and then that's it for that Sunday? Mm. Or do you think that the convenience of this moment because we're, we don't have to come to, you know, it's almost like people have gone through a psychological yeah. change what do you think? Do you think it's going think to it balance can, itself out? You know, that's a good question. I think it can go either way. Okay. But, you know, at the end of the day, I'm still old school. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I want to see the tent revival. Yeah, yeah, I want to yeah, see yeah. the Me doors too. of the church opening right, people right, right. flooding in, right, right. but not coming in and doing business as right. usual. Right. You know and what I, I mean? Guess, I guess I'm asking from the perspective of, you know, as, as pulpit leaders, if you're leading in the pulpit, you know, it's like, okay, we got our hopes up. When we come back from the pandemic, <laughs> I mean, we, it's going down. But what if it doesn't? Like, how, how do we handle for our own personal psyche if we come back and service ain't necessarily fiery like we think it's going to be? And I'm not saying it's not going to be. I'm just kind of playing devil's advocate, as they would say. I wonder if it's going to be like a brand new year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Watch night. We are on fire. We get mm -hmm. the theme for the year. We are gung-ho. January, we are dedicated. February, we are dedicated. By March, we start waning, but we're still going. Mm -hmm. By April, we want to be online again mm -hmm. because the thrill is gone. Right. So I, I just wonder, I think the people who are on fire are going to be on fire regardless. They're going to keep yeah. coming right. because they still come in April and May and June, July. Yeah, yeah. You know, kind of like the gym. You know, you see gym, the gym right. <laughs> in January. January. Yeah, you, can't, yeah. you, can't get a, uh, you can't get on the circuit. You can't get on the treadmill. But then by March, you can find it. Yeah. Any treadmill you want, they're all available. So I think that they may be, it may vacillate mm -hmm. in terms of what's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I think that for, I think churches everywhere, that first Sunday we come back after the pandemic, I think it's just going to be crazy everywhere because I know some of us has joked, we don't think Pastor says going to be able to preach that first Sunday because folks are just going to be so, I think, excited just to be back in That's the That's fine. I preached enough this <laughs> right, pandemic. Right, right. I mean, y'all can have it. In fact, I stay home. Yeah, exactly. Right. I, I just think that people are going to be so excited just to be back in the building. They're just going to want to just, like, get have, like, a crazy praise break. But like everybody said, will that be sustainable? Is it just going to last one Sunday, or is it going to sustain the rest of the year? But just like anything else, like you said with New Year's, it's hot. New Year's watch night service is hot in January, hot in February, come March and April, now it's starting to kind of like level itself out and it's just like, hey, church is, you know, back to normal. And then you have people who don't want to come back. They have, mm -hmm. they have gotten into the groove of, I like online church. And I have even teased um, where I attend church, uh, we have an online pastor. So I said I was going to put my transfer in. <laughs> <laughs> online ministry. So well, if they go back in 2021, I'm gonna be the online. I'm gonna be online until I feel that it's you know safe for me to go back. But there are some people who this is now what they prefer. Online is what they they want. Have we accepted that? And and, and you know I'm wrestling with that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things. So I somehow I ran across a message I had preached well over a year ago. Um, or a year ago, so last fall, 
Uh, and uh, it happened to be a CD in my car. I didn't know what it was, put it in. I listened to this message. And there was one, one point on the message where I made this statement about uh, a meme I saw where St. Peter's standing at the gate and uh, there's a person he's not allowing to come in to heaven. And the bubble says something to the effect of, since you didn't actually come to worship, but you watched it on, <laughs> on TV, then you can't actually come to heaven, but you can watch it on TV. <laughs> right? And I'm listening to this in the pandemic, and I cringed that I used that in my sermon because... There are so many statements that pastors and preachers are having to redact in our efforts to try to fill the pews pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. Now, we basically made it sound like you can't feel God at home. The anointing is not the same. Now, do I believe there is an essence when you're in the room? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Do I think that there is a, a certain or I mean, if not, they just could have had Pentecost and everybody be at their own house, right? But I do think there's something special about coming together. But I mean, we dogged people. And I'm wondering how many things, and, and let's just quickly, I don't want to stay here long, but let's throw out uh, something, that, if something comes to your mind, something that you feel we need to leave in the pandemic about how we have done ministry, uh, based upon how the times have changed, or for that matter, based upon how unscriptural or biblical or unspiritual it may have been, though it may have been a part of our church aura and tradition. So that's mine. Is I'm, I'm now confessing, you got me on tape, admitting that if you're one of those persons who decides to stay home and stream worship or be uh, in cyberspace, you don't have a different Holy Ghost than the people who decide to come back. Um, I'm going to stay on your point. I'm going to say that many of us who have made those statements or uh, created environments for our leadership, our staff, to make them feel like church can't go on. We have to repent for boxing God into the building because everything has shifted and now God has to, you have to make your home your sanctuary, your living room, your bathroom, your car, your whatever. So I do think that we should leave in the pandemic uh, make sure I'm saying this right maybe the importance that we gave the building and not just Sunday morning our meetings our, our, well, the, the music got to rehearse I'm a musician so I ain't giving y'all no grace but you know um, a lot of our meetings and some people felt like okay we can't meet unless we meet in that church or we can't we can't whatever <laughs> you know what I mean I, I, we got to be a person but I just think maybe to sum it up um, those of us in leadership whether pastoral leadership or uh, deacon, staff, what have you. We just need to give people more grace um, to practice their faith in unconventional ways. That was, that was, yeah, I said that right. Okay. okay. I think I already kind of said it. I believe that we should leave long services and long sermons. Come on, we're supposed to tarry <laughs> right. until the power comes. <laughs> no. <laughs> amen. Okay, so, no, amen. Yeah, because I have, you know, I've been, uh, Shekinah is my second home. So I've seen you do a five minute sermon, destroy, 15 minutes, and I've that. seen you 45 minutes. Oh, I've been longer than that. I hadn't gotten there. And I've seen <laughs> you longer than that. But the point is, you know how to tailor a message what? to fit. A particular time frame. Well, if we take out half of the touch of neighbors and drop kick the doll. Yeah, right. Exactly. So and that's what I said. If we take out the jargon, that emotional stimulation and high five, which I wasn't doing anyway. But <laughs> if we take all that stuff out and you just stick to content and the, what the Bible right. is saying, then your sermon can be much shorter. And that's a fact. Because in seminary, we couldn't do none of that. Oh, no. And. 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 and oh, <laughs> And I was just going to say something. I said, and that leaves room for the Holy Spirit to move. I don't think people are opposed to a long move of God. Right. I think people are, are opposed to long, ridiculously laborious church services that have no spirit in them and no reason to be that long. 
I mean, that's what I gather from your statement is, is it's not about trying to put the Lord on a calendar or on a schedule or a, a timesheet as much as it is. Let's just cut out the stuff we do. We know it really spirit led yeah, 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 yeah. and has no reason behind it. Right. And anybody who leads a ministry, and I mean inside the ministry, not necessarily just the pastor, but anybody in pastoral leadership, I think we're going to have to leave in the pandemic not listening to the people who you lead. Because now we're in a season where we're wow. trying our best to engage and feed. I mean, we're doing Bible study. We, we're doing this panel. We're doing service. We're adding this to service, taking it off, the way it looks, the graphics, the editing, the design. So I think all leaders in churches, um, from the pastor on down to the um, you know, servant leaders or whatever you call your leadership, we're going to have to begin to listen and lean on what our people really desire because i think a lot of times we just give them stuff like you go to eat at somebody's house they just just take all of it but i think we have to learn now how to that less is more in whatever way that means for your specific uh context because when when they get back then your people may be more vocal about okay why are we still doing that i thought we left that in march Right. And you got to be in the you got to be ready to receive. I mean, you have to be in the mind frame to receive it, um, you know, from a constructive criticism perspective. Um, so another thing we could possibly leave in the pandemic is just, you know, stop being so offended by criticism. I mean, I, I, I've had people tell me even right now on our broadcast, like, OK, this intro you have in the beginning, you know, I can do without that. You know, just get to the service. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, okay, well. You know, I mean, don't get so, I think sometimes when, when it's something we're doing, it's precious to us, it, it means a lot to us. Right. Anything that's said against it, you just mad, you just upset. But listen to what they're saying and maybe you're able to, you know, figure out a way to better do it. Makes sense. All right, let's talk about race okay. and religion. Because aside from worship, I think the other piece, a part of why I call this the fight for faith, is it's not just what does faith look like for me in, in this pandemic or without the pleasantries of coming together. That's one half of it. Mm -hmm. But the other half of it is when you look inside of the pandemic box, look beyond COVID and look at the other things that have affected us, many of which existed long before the pandemic, but the pandemic has given an opportunity, I think, for us to uh, zoom in on a lot of these other social issues among the, the most um, relevant and prevalent of them is race and racism. Um, some people say God doesn't see color. What's the... Doesn't matter what color you are. Okay, I'm, I'm not, that ain't no shade at Kirk. I like Kirk's music. But, yeah, God doesn't see color. What? I mean, the earth is not clear, so right. it's color in, his, in all of creation. So I wouldn't say God doesn't see color. The sky is blue, gray, water is blue, grass is green, and clearly he made humankind all different colors. So I can't say that God doesn't see color. I can also say that God doesn't just see one color. Right, that's the I'll leave it at that. Well, since you said racism, yeah. I want to start off by saying racism is a sin. I think racism is controlled by spiritual wickedness and high places, principalities, rulers of darkness. And I feel like any system that is designed to kill, steal, and destroy is not of God. And I feel like when you think about Jesus and his mission on the earth, he, he preached to the poor, you know, he cared about those who were downtrodden and broken. And it wasn't just about a gospel message in regard to, to accepting God, but he looked at their physical needs. And so when you have people who are constantly under injustice and constantly in situations where their physical needs are not being taken care of, I don't think God is pleased with that. And I feel like injustice anywhere is an issue. And I believe that because we serve a just God, when it's all said and done, he is gonna vindicate. I believe that, and I think that's part of the reason why I hold on, and part of the reason why I feel like you have to fight racism, because we as believers, we should stand against all sin. And racism, to me, and the systems that racism operate under, 
our sin. And so that's how I feel very strongly about that, especially when we have the idea that, oh, God doesn't see color, and if you're a Christian, you know, you shouldn't really rally against those things. Well, if we stand against sin, then how do we turn a blind eye to that and think it's okay? The so, so I'm hearing you say mm -hmm. something that really builds a bridge. It sounds like what I'm hearing is that the, even the phrase, God doesn't see color, is a statement being used and manipulated Absolutely. often by people to support not addressing racism. Absolutely, right. gives them a pass to turn the other pass. way. Absolutely. Wow. Because, you know, as you was talking, I was just thinking, Isaiah 1 and 17, I believe, says, learn to do good, seek justice, and correct oppression. Mm -hmm. So this notion that some, uh, those in the, some of those in the kingdom don't want to address racism is just wrong, and I think their silence speaks volumes because we're supposed to, you know, help the oppressed. We're supposed to help those that, you know, that people are wrong and then we're supposed to help those in need. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that a lot of evangelicals do not want to deal with the hard reality. It's a hard conversation. Because it's that, one, there's probably members in their, in their congregation <laughs> that, are, that, are, that are racist. So they don't, they don't want to speak to that because they don't want to run off nobody, they don't want to offend nobody because, well, you know what, or because it doesn't affect them. Mm -hmm. Some people tend not to talk about what doesn't affect them, so if it's not happening in your backyard, you may not address it. Say that last part again. I said if whatever, I said. You said some people don't like talking about. Right, some people don't like talking about it because if it doesn't affect them, if it's not in their backyard, they're not going to address it. So it's the whole excuse, uh, I, I, uh, let me give myself an excuse out of something. It's the whole, let me, that's not me. Or like some people will say, I'm not racist, I'm not personally racist. As if a person's personal behavior now somehow washes away the, the problem on a systemic level. Okay, I want to hear your thoughts on this whole piece. So I'm currently studying critical race theory and implicit bias. And first off, they talk about how race is a social construction. So essentially, race is something created by society. It doesn't even exist. But since it is a social construction, then they use, okay, I'm the dominant, I'm the majority, you are inferior to me, so I'm going to box you in and give you these um, labels. I'm going to give you these, uh, I'm attach these behaviors to, to you. So we have, as African Americans, we've been Sambo and Jezebel and Aunt Jemima and, you know, all those things. So all of that is created by the majority. And then they also talk about colorblindness. It's a farce because, you know, when someone says to me, I don't see color, so you don't see that I'm brown. Right, that's offensive. You, you, don't, you don't see who I am? That would be like saying, you don't see that I'm a woman, and mm -hmm. clearly I am. Mm -hmm. It's a problem. And so just like um, uh, Elder Al said, people don't want to have to deal with it, so they come up with these excuses, colorblindness, to say, I'm not like that. But the problem is, implicit bias, the theory says, everybody has a bias, and they're, um, they're un... Subconscious. Yes, mm -hmm. they're unconscious. So. You, you see a woman, a black woman, you think she might be angry. You know, you see a man, you grab your purse. And they're often outside of what you believe are your convictions. So you can come in for it, you can have an interview, you don't hire this black person because you have an implicit bias because you think they're gonna be lazy on the job, but the, their resume is better than the, the other person's resume. You have implicit bias, and even though you didn't want to see that this man was black, you saw him black, and your implicit bias, your unconscious bias, allowed you to give Billy the job when you know that Jamal should have had it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was gonna say, it's also a heart issue, because some of it is explicit, which is a heart issue, some of it is implicit, but once again, as a believer, we're supposed to be trusting God to work all that out to work out our soul's salvation, to get to the root of us. Just like any other sin that we may struggle with, we're supposed to trust God. God, work on creating me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in me. So if I'm looking at someone a certain way because of their race, all that should be dealt with if we say we're believers. And if you choose to continue to turn a blind eye to that or just allow those blind spots to kind of stay and just, you know, I believe in God and I'm a Christian and 
I'm just not going to touch that over there. Are we really working out the things we should be working out? It's, in, it's like any issue in your life that might not be pleasing to God is our job to get that, put that under the blood and to really work on those things. So, so here's what they say, though, right? What we ought to just be doing is praying. See, we need to have prayer meeting. And we need to come together and we need to call a fast. And we need to pray that racism, this marching y'all doing and protesting that you're doing and all this Black Lives Matter and all this other stuff. See, that's just a trick of the enemy mm -hmm. to lure you into the God of this age. But see what the saints ought to be doing. You know, remember you in the world, but you not of the world and you're not supposed to be out there with the world. But this is the stuff that even particularly us in the black church, we are being fed. And, and, and I raise this, this tension tonight in hopes to help somebody who's watching us, who's struggling perhaps, because you almost feel that to own your culture, and I'll say that in case there are those who are watching who are not black, but to own your race or your culture or your heritage somehow is antithetical to you also acknowledging your faith. Hmm. And so there's this disconnect between uh, who I am naturally and who I am spiritually and the theory is that never the twain shall meet and I just personally don't believe that is the case mm -hmm. but, I, but I'm leaning into this because they're evangelicals and others who, are, who are try to suggest that as believers we should not be concerned with social justice we're just supposed to accept these are the last and evil days you know we're just supposed to love one another and simply witness to others and get more souls saved and uh, you know, I just, I refuse to buy that. But my question to you concerning it is, do you think that that involvement in matters, speaking up about issues, being involved in matters of social justice, do you feel that it enhances or diminishes the witness of the Christian? It absolutely enhances it. Because again, if we're in a fight, we're fighting against things that are ungodly. And to me, racism is ungodly. So if we're in a fight, it speaks more to your Christian, and I'm not putting things on a hierarchy, but Jesus didn't just pray, he did. What is love without action? So if you're saying you love someone or you're saying you're showing the love of Christ, but all you're gonna do is pray, but you see me getting shot in the street, praying is not enough. There's more that needs to be done. Marching, doing what you can. Everybody can't march. You have some people who have financial resources. You have people who speak out through their art or through teaching. Whatever it is that you do, just like we use our gifts for the kingdom, whatever it is that you do, whatever gift that you have, you can use it to fight injustice in the form of racism. Because, like I said, that, that spirit that comes to kill, still destroy, particularly a, a particular group of people, is not godly. And so to, to rally against that is nothing but godly. I was going to say that I believe it's Micah, um, Micah 6 and 8, and it talks about doing justice, mm -hmm. not praying for it. Right. You, yeah. The Lord requires you to do justice. Action. That's right. And what does that look like? It might be praying for the person who can't march, right. but it means I have to actively do something. I have to be engaged somehow. And so if that is sewing into a particular um, organization that you know is doing justice, or if it's supporting some type of business that is doing justice, or marching, or whatever, or using your platform to speak against it, then you have to do it. So, I mean, that's, that's the Bible. We have to do justice. I'm going to stir the pot right here. For, for a lot of people, pray, prayer is lazy. Hmm. For you to say, I'm just going to pray, that's lazy. Because number one, a lot of us have said, I'm praying for you, never prayed. And then, what is the intent behind it? So I put a status up on Facebook a few months ago in the midst of all the injustice. I was like, something to the effect of, it's hard to add souls to the kingdom when the souls are supposed to be adding, we keep putting them in the ground. Hmm. And it just, I just believe that a lot of the funerals we've wow. watched, a lot of the funerals we've watched, we, it didn't have to ha people don't have to be killed and shot or wrongly, you know, done wrong or whatever the injustice is. Like, I mean, and then you have the, so the same people who make the statements of we should just pray or we should just whatever, they're the same people that talk about black on black crime, which is not 
real. Right. The same okay. people that would would criticize somebody like Breonna Taylor for dying in her sleep. Nothing right. she could have done. Right. Uh, or they'll try to criminalize. Every time a black person is killed, they got to go pull something criminal. So when both of them, John was shot, they went and found out he had marijuana in the house. When Trayvon right. Martin was killed, they went and found a picture of him with his middle fingers up. And all of that detracts away from the point of they should not be dead. It was an injustice. I mean, how, like, like you just said, Pastor, my, who I am and my spirituality is fused together. It's not separate. So... I just feel like to say, oh, we should just pray, or if my people that's called by my name would humble themselves and turn from the wicked ways, well, what do you consider to be wicked ways? Come on. You know, we got to, we got to, I think a lot of this is wrapped in interpretation. Shacking and right. smoking <laughs> and saying? you fornicators right, right, right. and the three or four top sins that yeah. we want to try to throw out to people. Exactly. Homosexuality, right. the stuff right. we, that's the wicked ways the church is talking about. And all that, right. Come on. We don't, we don't, we don't. We don't get beyond that. And I'm like, come on, y'all. Like, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I think that a lot of us are serving one God and some people serving another God because we believe that the God we serve is on the side of the oppressed, on the side of those that have been wrong. And if you read, the, if you read anything with Jesus in it, that's right. he did justice. He didn't just say, let's pray about it. He said, no, everybody that's out here condemning this woman for being caught in adultery, okay, you cast your stone, you cast your stone, you cast your stone. Correct. And everybody had to walk away because Jesus did not castigate her for them protesting, so to speak, whatever. He said, no, y'all are committing an injustice to her. Y'all need to get it together. And I think that it offends people when you call them out on their bias. I was going to say something else with a B and an S in it, but I thought bias would have. Oh, it, that has a bit in church. Too. Come on, I'm listening. This is good, my soul. Well, you know what I think one of the main problems is I just thought about, and not to try to go off topic, but I think one of the reasons why a lot of people or a lot of evangelicals don't address this stuff because they have, everything now has become political. It's not no longer spiritual no more. Everything is about politics. Everything is about what you know, 45 said. So you know what 45 said is justified. So you know what, we're gonna justify it. Everybody wants to turn the blind, everybody wants to make it political and this is a spiritual fight. And it's just like, no, you can't, you can't make this political. This is, this is wrong. It's like Sister Tan said, it's a sin, it's injustice. Nobody should, we should not, the, the number of funerals, number of people that have been shot this, this year alone, out of, out of stupidity, I mean, now we're dealing with the Jacob Blake situation. That was, I don't care what was going on with him or what he may have done in his past, who deserves to get shot seven times in their back? And there are people, Christians, trying to justify it. Because why? Because their agenda is political because they believe in what somebody else said what a political party or what a political person says, and they're not going with their convictions. Now, let's keep it real, bro. You have people in the church saying that Hurricane Katrina was sin. Yes. And, and, and the tsunami <laughs> is no, sin. No, no, I, rem no I remember, I remember yeah. that because when, when Katrina hit Louisiana, I've heard, I heard preachers and pastors, oh, that's because, you know, Louisiana, Louisiana, New Orleans, they do that black magic down there. They got all them witches Ignorant. down there. Right. I, I heard it all. And, and so I, that's why I agree with what my sister said. I mean... Okay, let's redefine sin. Like, not, not those sins That's you listed right. earlier. No, right. this injustice is sin, and we just got to call it what it is. I mean, and if it makes you uncomfortable, then maybe you have to confront how you perhaps have participated in not calling it out or doing injustice. And that was my thought to what he said very quickly. You know why people do that? Because they benefit from it. Anytime people will perpetuate a system, whether it's racism or patriarchy, they perpetuate what they benefit from. Mm. And so you always got to go sniff out, how did you benefit from this? In what way does this help whatever agenda you are for? Because when people are able to benefit from something, then they will push it. They won't fight against what cuts them a check or gives them a break or creates an opportunity or gives them a photo op or gives them some sense of influence. Exactly. 
So I'm from Wisconsin, so the Kenosha issue um, hits mm. home to me. Mm. I'm right next door. My hometown is the neighboring city. Yeah. And so when I watch the news, or I couldn't watch the video because I've seen enough. Yeah. I mean, I've been seeing lynchings and outright yeah. murders. Um, so, you know, the headline was someone, you know, Jacob was shot. No, he was murdered. That's the first thing. So he was murdered by the police. But I saw people like you were saying about excuses, the lack of compliance, what well, he should have, he should have. And it's like, you know what? <laughs> Boy, that takes me off the edge and I have to be very careful about what I say and what I post because of my position. Right. But um, one of the things that I always think about is one, something that one of my um, cohort members said. She said that they criminalize, criminalize black people and they medicalize white people. Say that. Ooh. So when you are black and you do something, let's not even think about death. I don't know if you all remember a little, I think a little person was at the zoo and they fell in the cage with an animal and they immediately went to what the parents, the dad was a criminal and the mom was a criminal. Okay, and then a non-black person, same thing happened, fell in with the monkeys and you didn't see, that wasn't in the headline. Um, so we go back to Dylan Roof, murdered nine people, he got food, so he got chauffeur, so he got an Uber. They took him to Burger King. <laughs> he got food, he was Ubered down in, uh, in a style that the black people never make it. But they go to, oh, he has a medical history, there's insanity, he watched too many video games, blah, 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 blah. But if it's, a, if it's an African-American person, they immediately go to criminal, cr criminalizing. Let's dig up what we can to find out he had marijuana in his system or he used to sell drugs or he was in a gang. It's, why? Because racism. Right. Which is wicked. <laughs> and it operates in deception. The enemy operates in deception. So it's that whole thing, that whole system. And like Pastor was saying, people are going to perpetuate things that they benefit from, but also when you have activity over government and over political systems and the agendas are of this world and the agendas are not godly, people buy into that as well, you know, because Satan is having his way. And, and, and all types of the housing, education, all types of systems, Satan is running free and people are blind, not realizing it's more spiritual than anything, you know, where it's manifested by what's happening, but it's, it's spiritual wickedness. A lot of people had a problem with the, the protesters, the protesting and the rioting when it became violent and when it got to looting and whatever. But I, I had to really sit and wrestle with that because not only can you not tell me how angry I should be when I see somebody who looks like me dead, but how many times have our communities been gentrified? That's looting. How many times have our wow. communities been destroyed, our businesses taken away, or those of us who may have wanted to start a business not given the loan because somebody behind the computer was playing with numbers? Like, I, I just, I don't know, I, I wrestle with it because it's like you want, like you all have stated, you want to perpetuate, you want us to believe it's this, hmm. but it's like, a blanket statement so when somebody dies and you go find out he had marijuana in the system it's like okay we got to give you a new narrative we got to put a new story in your head so you don't see the injustice of it we got to get you to say well this person probably would have been better off dead hmm. they deserve it. yeah right so if did you want to say something I don't know if, okay so if 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 a lot of what we're talking about here with this conversational racism and injustice if that's the problem, I'm wondering if the revival, I'm ready to bridge this, if the revival we're talking about post-pandemic may look a lot more social than churchy. What if revival didn't happen at the altar, but that revival was about an awakening, and I'm thinking this, Think about the Valley of Dry Bones. That wasn't a congregation. That was an army. That was a sleeping army. And in essence, they were awakened for battle. Come on, sir. And, and I say that 
to broaden our scope, not our scope as a panel, but in terms of as a people, to the idea that maybe the Lord was sick of having church. Hmm. Hence, the scripture in Amos. You know, I don't want, you know, I don't want your songs and all of that. That's not what, the, that's not even the fast the Lord is calling for. To take away the noise of your songs, all this music. And he talks about justice being done. What if it took this in the midst of a pandemic to get many of us who, who would not perhaps have the boldness to speak or do justice to, to deal with it for what it is. And there's so much that I, I want to say, and time won't allow me to say it, but I will share this story. Um, and then I'll raise one more question. Um, a few years ago, I've been to India a couple of times. The first time I went, I went on a mission trip for three and a half weeks. And one of the young ladies who was on that trip with me, we had just met, um, she was a Caucasian young lady. And we ended up engaging in a very interesting conversation about multicultural ministry. And I basically raised to her then my concerns about um, why there are so many, kind of the, what I call the cycle, okay? Where you have a person who is in, who's part of a black ministry, uh, they get hurt by the church, and then in, in return, they leave that church and a lot of times go find a church of another ethnicity. And, and, and now the picture of kingdom becomes when you walk into church, I'm not judging anybody's church for this, but you walk into church and it's all of these nationalities and these flags, a lot of times of countries the church hadn't even been to or do ministry in. But we want to paint this picture like it's like we're, you know, so multicultural is a thing. And, and again, I do believe, I don't believe heaven is segregated. I believe God's this, you know, so we're not arguing that. But I've raised to her my concern, and she made a statement that blew my mind. She said, she said, you're the ones who are often trying to make cult church multicultural. She said, a lot of times our philosophy is we're going to be what we are. And if, if you're attracted to that, then come on. But if you're not, then so be it. And that blew my mind away because I realized in that moment that she had made a statement of truth that, that I and many like me are afraid to make. So we'll throw out the Hammond, and I'm not turning this into that, right? But we'll throw out the Hammond organ. We don't want to hear a choir sing. We, we, you know, we want to heal song ourselves in, in the kingdom. And I love heal song, right? I love it all. But my point is that we'll almost feel ashamed you get a person and they preach too loud or they sing or they seem in their praise too demonstrative. We sit them down and the, and the sound of the kingdom now, the kingdom sound is ah. Lullabies. And it's right, <laughs> lullabies. That's now the kingdom sound. And, 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 and in our effort to, to intentionally force multicultural ministry or for, force a multi-ethnic context of ministry, I wonder if it's almost like farm-raised fish that's not growing organically, but we're trying to force something that then doesn't fit us, and it, all, and it seems okay until we end up in a climate like this where we have to address injustice, and then you get a bunch of preachers and leaders and, and spiritual persons in positions who are afraid to speak out because we don't want to offend the farm-raised fish environment we've created in ministry. Preach, Rouson. I'm doing my best. Do it, and I'm wondering if, I said all that to say that I'm wondering if, that, if the revival we're talking about is really a sense of spiritual consciousness where I understand that God did not call me to, to live in a sense of duplicity where I claim to be bold for the Lord, but only if it fits within the allowed context of somebody else who I don't want to offend. And that if, what if the idea of revival is not awakening the choir, but awakening the army so that we can arise to fight? So with that in mind, I want to ask this question. In light of a, quote, new normal within the body of Christ, how do you envision, in a few words, how do you envision the next season of, 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 of ministry and of faith? Well, it already seems like God has done a new thing. 
So it would be my prayer and my vision that he keep that we don't lose the new thing that he has done. You know, we talked about church looking different, but post pandemic, it's my prayer that the hearts of the people have been changed. So that when we do come back, if it's God's will for us to come back together in that way, it church just looks different. It feels different because we we've, we've done so much work on our own while we were by ourselves and to ourselves that when we come in, we're just on one accord and the, the, the spirit can really flow and the Lord can really have his way in the way he intends because we are really all here for the same purpose with the same mindset. Awesome. Somebody want to add to that? I'm, I'm struggling to find an answer. I guess my hope and my prayer would be that we, like, like you said, we appreciate each other more. When I say that, I mean whoever we are, whatever ministry looks like for us, individual or whatever uh, uh, place we go to do ministry, that we just appreciate it more, that we do not allow false narratives to interrupt what God's will is for that or this particular body of people and that as we've all been on this um, topic, that justice would prevail in more than just on the national scale, but even within our own families and in our own friendship circles, that we, we do justice um, more than we have done it before. I would like to see a reflection um, of what's happening in the world happen in the church. So the, the world is doing justice, right? And they are working to seriously eradicate the inequities and um, all the systemic issues. And I'd like to see that reflected in the church because the church might not have racism, but it has a lot of isms. True. And I hope that there is a dismantling in the kingdom of those isms as well because we can get past racism, but are we going to deal with sexism, right? So <laughs> I just hope that they, it's a mirror, that we are whole externally and internally. I guess my prayer is I just hope behind all of this that we have experienced in 2020 that there's a new hunger um, for God, that we will just just be hungry for him like never before and just and just really just rush to hear what he is saying. No distractions, no fluff, no hoopla, just the word of God. Well, thank you all for being a part of this night. I think that we could probably go on another hour easily. Um, and, I, and I would hope to have each of you back for, for some sense of dialogue because I think conversations are healthy. Um, each of you have helped us tonight in um, rethinking and reshaping um, spirituality. I want to say this as, as we get ready to, um, to leave your home tonight, that um, one of the things, and we didn't really get to address this, but one of the other sides of this pandemic has been uh, the enormous amount of grief and sorrow and death and trying to fight for a sense of healthy spiritual well-being I want to encourage you tonight in our fleeting moments to remember that, and, and I taught this last month in a piece about our feelings under pressure, that God is not offended by the feelings that we feel. In fact, we have a high priest who's touched by those feelings and is waiting for us to come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find the grace to help us in the time of need. I want to tell you that uh, this is a fight for our faith. It's, it's a fight. It's a, it's a fight. It's a struggle. It's a wrestle. And it's something that you're going to have to do every day. But with the help of the Lord, you can fight this and you can do this. I want to suggest to you that you don't allow the times we live in to make you turn into somebody God does not like. Don't allow the pressure from the outside to create in you a person on the inside that's not pleasing to God. You have to wake up every single day to make it your agenda. 
Lord, help me to be more and more like you. And that's our prayer for you tonight. And we've, and we've addressed these kinds of topics because we want you to see, uh, if you will, the bowl of tension that being a believer is set in in a time like this. That yes, you're going to have to deal with racism and you're going to have to deal with injustices. And you're going to have to deal uh, with all types of attacks from every area and spiritual, hosts of spiritual wickedness in high places. These are the kinds of things that in these days we're going to have to deal with and fight through. But by, by all means, make sure you fight. And having done all to stand, stand therefore with your loins girt about with truth. And I'm telling you that if you are willing to be courageous enough to stand for God, then you would be surprised to see just how much God has your back. If you don't know the Lord in the free pardon of your sins, pray with me, God, I come in Jesus' name. I acknowledge that I am a sinner, but I confess that you are the Savior. I believe that you died for me, that you rose for me, and by your grace, through my faith, I am saved. Be my Lord, and I will be yours forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me tonight, you accepted Christ as your Savior, then there is a link at the bottom of the comment section. I want you to click on that link uh, at the end of this moment and uh, give us that e-card. Let us know that you made a decision for Christ. I want to encourage you in the days to come, go back and watch this video again. There's so many nuggets, hidden gems that came through in the conversation that I believe will be a help to you. And as always, you can always be a blessing to our church, and there are several modalities in which you're able to give, all of which are right there uh, at the bottom of the screen. But most importantly, we want you in the days to come, share your testimony, as I said earlier. Post that scripture that's dear to your heart and why it is. Let's keep the spirituality going. And every day when you wake, then your confession should constantly say, Oh, Lord, help me be spiritual. I'll see you next time.